In fact, I felt incredibly pressured to be here. What answer is there to a request to give a speech on bravery other than yes? <laughs> My first instinct, however, was no. And uh, I tried really hard to be incredibly busy and preoccupied this morning. But truly, how can you say no to an invitation like this without seeming like a complete chicken? And disinclined as I was to face the, trick, the chicken that is me, I opted instead to face the abject fear of being here. So I erased the, ah, uh, sorry, no email and jumped to yes. And in some respects, there is an essential and innate bravery in accepting rather than declining. It's not a bad maxim, really. When in doubt, say yes. And then the dilemma of what to say and how to populate a few minutes on a topic on which I have no authority whatsoever. I have never run into a burning building. I have never stared down a disease. I've never been called on to muster courage in the classic ways that we think of it. So I was a bit stumped. And I was deeply afraid of being trite and aphoristic. The last thing you need, or frankly deserve at this hour, is some amateur psychology and an invocation to find your creative courage. So, stumped as I was, I did the only thing I know how to do, and what I do every day, I facilitated a process. And I hoped that that process would get me to greater understanding. So I mined other people's wisdom. And like a true Edmonton magpie, I stole all the shiny things and I put them into my nest. So I crowdsourced my talk. I asked about 60 people, what is the bravest thing that you do every day? And this is what I heard from the voices that I'm going to call throughout this talk my wise chorus. The wise chorus said two key things. One, we in the cocoon of middle-class comfort are not called on to be brave ever. And two, bravery is a cloak for fear. So I'm going to unpack both of those ideas while I have your attention this morning. Let's look at this first notion of not being brave. Consistently, the people I connected to said this. Nothing about our lives requires us to be truly brave. Yes, we have to be thoughtful, we have to be tenacious, we have to be dogged and hardworking and creative and agile, but not really brave. Bravery, I learned from my wise sources, has very distinct qualities. It's doing what you don't have to and standing up for your beliefs in the face of grave danger and distinct disadvantage. There was no imperative, for example, for Malala Yousafzai to be brave. The Pakistani schoolgirl who stood up for her beliefs in educational quality for girls and was shot in the head by the Taliban for doing so didn't really need to do it. But she chose to champion her beliefs even when it was foolhardy to do so. She's still doing it. She's still a target the world over. And even though now the world is watching, she remains in incredible peril. That's brave. And the Saudi women who just last week mounted a campaign to make the point that they wish to be able to get about under their own steam, faced social censure, rejection, violence even at the hands of their appalled family members. But it didn't stop them. They did it anyway. 
that's brave. And my local hero, Carly, who dreads the winter, and not in the same way that you or I dread the winter. It's chilly, there's hassle. No, for Carly, winter means that getting to work on time, catching her bus, making it to her theater rehearsal is just that much trickier because the snow gunks up her wheelchair. Compared to many of us, Carly is brave. There she is. Ironically, it's not likely that any of these heroes would call themselves brave. They'd say they're doing what they must in the situations that they find themselves in. And if that is the definition of brave, despite what my wise sources said, we may in fact actually be brave because we're doing what we must in the situations that we find ourselves. Perhaps courage ultimately is as John Wayne said, being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. So what are we scared of? If bravery is mostly bravado, interesting, it's the same root word, it's the performance we put on to cloak our fear, what are we actually afraid of? Well, we're frightened to death of not knowing the answer. Lots of the people I connected to shared this fear. And they said that they have to, every day, muster, to, muster the courage to face the uncertainty that is a key feature of giving advice. This one really rang true for me. I facilitate three or more sessions a week with groups, large and small, on topics about which I know next to nothing. My clients hire me to help them get from A to B on an issue. I'm supposed to move them from disagreement to some kind of consensus, from confusion to some kind of clarity, from a blank page to a plan, from not knowing to some kind of understanding. The trouble is, I'm always a tourist in their world, whether it's rural electrification challenges, land use disagreements, watershed management, or occupational health and safety legislation, I don't know anything much about these topics. And it's impossible to become an instant expert. I can only do a certain amount of homework. So the typical five-hour facilitation process, which I do many times a week, looks and feels something like this. It's 10 a.m. I'm in a room with a bunch of strangers on a brand new topic being paid to bring clarity to the situation. Kill me now. How will I ever get through the next five hours? Sometimes I daydream with sweet anticipation about the prospect of fainting. I really do. But I'm so vain, I worry that I would faint in, a, in an ungainly fashion and that my skirt would ride up and that that ultimately would be way, way worse than not knowing what I'm talking about. And so, despite the anxiety, we begin. And we usually share our expectations and do some kind of getting to know you exercise. I listen at that point somewhat desperately for clues. And now it's noon, and we've got several pages of flip chart notes, and we are grinding painfully to mutual understanding. Nothing is clear. We've all had to accept that the muddle is part of the process. And by now, I've probably said to this room about 117 times, what I'm hearing you say is, but by restating, sorting, synthesizing, summarizing their insights, we are inching along. And now it's two o'clock. And things are starting to make more sense. We're being smart and thoughtful and insightful and a bit provocative and, and certainly future focused together. It's become a safe room in which to float a new idea or to suggest a new way of thinking. 
I'm still not the expert, but I've been granted by now permission to curate the ideas that are coming up. We're trusting each other, and I'm starting to trust myself. And now it's 3 o'clock, and we're almost through, and there's a certain elation bubbling in the room. We've made some headway. We may not have figured everything out, certainly, but we've made some collective decisions about what's next. We've surprised ourselves a little. New thinking has emerged from that muddle, from the uncertainty, from the talking. The notion that many heads are better than one has been proven yet again. But boy, did we ever have to trust the process and one another to get to deeper clarity rather than superficial answers. So finally, at about the three o'clock mark most days, my overwhelming nausea, my dread that this indeed will be the day that I am discovered for the imposter that I truly am, starts to lift. We are frightened to death of being outed as imposters. And I heard this numerous times from the wise chorus. Part of the art of becoming a seasoned professional is trusting that one does indeed have something of value to offer. And that the inevitable insecurity of feeling unaccomplished isn't a bad thing. At its best, it's a positive human emotion from which empathy, generosity, and humility can flow. Imposter syndrome is far more attractive than pompous syndrome. It just requires, like most of our fears, some managing. This is from an accomplished lawyer. There are no answers. I've had to get used to telling people that. It's not what we expect to hear from a lawyer, but the humility and authenticity are really welcome. Like this lawyer, I've really had to get over my fear of not knowing the answer. And for me, it's been a real process of growing up and shedding the need to be right. That desperate need to deliver an answer like an ace in a card game. Early in my career, I was so eager to have that magic answer. Young Katrin worked hard to be the smartest, the quickest, the wisest. I couldn't bear the thought of not being the best. But the older I get, now over 25 years in this communications business, the more interested I am in openness. I prefer good questions to quick answers. I like the process of discovery and understanding, not just landing on a solution. I like to uncover possibilities, not positions. And I truly believe that wisdom resides in the space between opinions. Working this way has unburdened me. It's lightened my load. It's in fact made me feel a bit younger. As a child, I was an ancient creature. I was burdened by a desire to get it right. Even in my first year at school, aged three, I was much older than I am now. Youth really is wasted on the young. It also seems to me that we are frightened to death of being vulnerable, and so we cover it up. We need to seem brave to mask insecurity, and to do so, we've appropriated the language of the battlefield to speak about intellectual courage. Those of us in the world of idea combat, and that's all of us, we pick our battles, we suit up, we save our ammunition, we keep our powder dry, we take no prisoners, we refuse to die on any number of hills. We've dressed ourselves up in camo gear, and we're fighting for our ideas. Deep down, though, we pretty much know that figuring it out together might, in fact, be a much more reasonable approach. But there are currently no 
noble metaphors for collaborative idea building. And I think we should ennoble the language of uncertainty and vulnerability. It should become strategically and tactically outstanding to muddle through, to noodle around, to plow on, to dip a toe, to give it a whirl, to try it on for size. In fact, I'd like to see us swapping out of our camo gear and being willing to be seen, being in the light of vulnerability and uncertainty instead of in the disguise of being right. And this came to me from a, a member of my wise chorus. She's a successful corporate VP out of Calgary. I have to be brave enough to show myself in a way that lets others really show themselves too. And this from a courageous campaign manager, you might be able to guess who this person is, who said, the bravest thing I do every day is ask others for advice. When we reveal and when we get real, we permit others to do so as well. And then authenticity replaces artifice. This is about being willing to be vulnerable. I want to be clear that it doesn't mean being vague or unprepared or heaven forbid vacuous, but it does mean softening up, opening up. In the voice of a high school principal, my bravery, such as it is, is my willingness to lead with my heart wide open to so many people every day. Heart wide open. It's instructive because we're frightened to death of getting to know who we're dealing with. Clients have the awkward habit of being human. And they bring with them a set of issues that probably have nothing to do with the project. And despite our appetite for the comfort of designation, client, supplier, expert, neophyte, we blur these lines by the very act of being human. And since that we know that we are a species wired for narrative and not instructions, it's important that we break out of the role playing and meet each other on a human plane. This from an eminent cardiologist. It is more important to know and understand the person who has the disease than what type of disease they have. I was really surprised by this from a person who has about 12 letters after his name. I thought that he might wield his specialization like Harry Potter's wand. But no, the reason he's good is because he's more interested in the person than in the presenting medical problem. I'm not advocating that you should become friends with your clients necessarily. But if you are putting a fence around them, I would suggest it's because we fear intimacy. Like it or not, business, especially this creative communications business that we're in, is intimate. And what would a creative morning be if we didn't talk about love? We bandy about the phrase, I love my job. Even Rob Ford loves his job. <laughs> but the idea that resonates much more powerfully for me is the notion of working in a loving way. I'm of the view that working with humans is not only intimate, it is ultimately an act of love, which was another big aha of my crowdsourced talk. Lots of people that I connected to agreed with this. They said, the bravest thing I do every day is love and trust myself and others. This from a soldier. The nurses I worked with in Afghanistan held the hands of the horribly burned, cradled Afghan children that were dying, and helped wash and prepare the bodies of soldiers and civilians who were killed in very horrible ways. 
I am certain that somewhere in each nurse, at some time during the tour, there was something that screamed inside them and repelled them. Their courage was controlling that impulse day after day. To work in a loving way requires the courage to control our impulses. It is easy to be offended, to be miffed, to be mad, to be irritated, to be frustrated, to be proud. It is much harder to self-edit, to take a breath, to step back, to choose a different response. Often, the most courageous thing we do every day is not give in to the worst of ourselves, our basest emotions. Rising above ourselves has its own brave qualities and its own considerable rewards. I'm also going to suggest to you that we are frightened to death of the bigness of excellence. Fear of failure is easy to understand. It's all part and parcel of that dread of not knowing the right answers. But we might just fear brilliance more than we fear failure. From the theater director who said, I have to be brave enough to tell someone who is giving their all to give me more, to push for more. Insisting on excellence is its own conundrum. We can always explain away failure. Someone else's fault, too low a budget, cautious client, institutional folly, but brilliance, excellence, exceptionality, much harder to face. We might, in that case, just have to own our own ability, step into our light. Our, di our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? That's not my wise chorus this time, but Marianne Williamson. And I tried really, really hard today to stay away from self-help talk. But I'm looking at you, and you are brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. You're going to have to get brave enough to be comfortable with that and be nuanced enough to be gentle about it. I'm circling back now to my opening gambit that, that in reality we are rarely called on to be truly brave in the traditional sense. And that in fact, what bravery we do muster is to face our own fears. And this reminds me of a fantastic passage from a book by Bruce Chatwin about Australia called The Song Lines. In it, he talks about the fact that as a more primitive people, we knew what our external threats were. And so we built fires so that we could see the enemy, and that fire became a comfort, and it was for our protection, and it was also a place for us to build community. But now, he says, we huddle around a different source of light, the screen. And increasingly, we do this alone. We're no longer sure of the enemy. We suspect it might be within. But we still need the comfort of that glow. But now, it's to keep us safe from ourselves. Perhaps the bravest thing we really do is know ourselves and understand that when we face those things of which we are scared to death, then we can drop the bravery cloak. It seems fitting that I would give the last wise chorus voice to the most important person in my life. And with apologies to my beloved husband, this is from my hairdresser. Who said, the bravest thing I do is face the day not knowing what or who 
it will bring. Not knowing what or who today would bring, I trusted and loved these 60 people enough to carry me through, to let their wisdom reveal some insights and answers, and to move, most importantly, from being right to kind of getting it right. I really didn't know what to say. I truly didn't have the answer. I only knew how to be vulnerable enough to muddle through and get to a place of greater understanding. So that's what I did. I asked for advice, and my wise and generous chorus gave me their thoughts on bravery and shared with me their fears. And in doing so, they bestowed upon me the courage to get this done today. I hope that I have helped you saddle up to your Friday with gracious and courageous uncertainty.